Hi everybody, we're going to be getting started here in just about a minute. We have some good uh, speakers lined up to join us today. My name is Chris Ash and we'll have a few people joining us shortly. We're here for Teach Trafficking Truths Day. Uh, we're here because there's a lot of motivation and excitement to learn more about what trafficking is and also the challenge with having a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of excitement, a lot of energy and motivation to do something about human trafficking is that a lot of times people who are excited and want to do something may not know where to start. They may not know a whole lot about what human trafficking is, about how they can um, how they can help address the issue. And so we're here today, uh, multiple different organizations have been giving lives all day long. I've learned so much from these other folks. I've joined lives from uh, Justice at Last and Polaris and Heal and Freedom Network USA. Uh, learned so much today. They're all going to have their lives saved on their feed, so you may want to check that out and see what everyone has uh, going on. See, uh, catch what you missed earlier today. But my name is Chris Ash. I am with the National Survivor Network. Um, I can tell you a little bit about the NSN. By the way, my pronouns are they and them. Um, and the NSN, National Survivor Network, we're a program of the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking. We were started in the 2011, so we've been around a while, to foster connections between people with lived experience of human trafficking and to build an anti-trafficking movement that is led by, motivated by, driven by survivors. We want survivors to be at the forefront, recognized as the leaders that we are. I can tell you a little bit about the National Survivor Network. We are a um, values-based, survivor-led, professional membership community for survivors of trafficking who are either engaged in or preparing for leadership in the many movements to end violence. And we use a human rights, public health, and harm reduction approach. So what does that mean? What that means is survivor-led, um, I'm a survivor of trafficking. All of our leadership team have lived experience that fits the definition of trafficking. All of our members have that lived experience. Um, we, uh, we have a autonomy, even though we're a program of CAST, we have a whole lot of autonomy over how we do our work, what messaging we put out, how we manage the budget. Um, we're values-based, and so we recognize if you think about how you want to do organizing, how we want to create community change, how we want to end human trafficking, how we want to end all forms of violence and exploitation. If you've ever tried collaborating with other people who don't share your values to accomplish a goal, sometimes it gets a little chaotic and there can be conflict, there can be harm that happens. Sometimes you just feel less effective because you've got people rowing in different directions, right? So we have values about the way we're going to work and do our, our efforts to end trafficking so that we can be a space for people who share those values to collaborate with us. People who don't share those values, there are a lot of people who don't share every single one of our values who are doing incredible, powerful work, and they're doing it in other spaces, right? So it's not about tearing down anyone. It's about defining who we are. We're a professional advocacy network. So even though we are survivors, we're not a therapy group. We aren't um, able to provide direct services. We're people who are working in this movement. We are program managers and consultants and trainers and writers and speakers and budget managers, right? We have a lot of different roles in this field that we fill. We're a community and what that means is we are learning to be in community with each other and with the rest of the, the people doing this anti-trafficking work. And we use a human rights lens that centers anti-oppression. We want to find approaches to ending trafficking that give people more rights and secure and solidify rights rather than taking away rights. We want to use a public health approach that centers primary prevention. What that means is that we want to be stopping the trafficking before it ever happens. So if we're doing a curriculum that teaches um, young people how to recognize if they're being trafficked and go get help, that's great secondary prevention, but it doesn't prevent the trafficking before it ever happened. Primary prevention tends to need us to focus more on communities and societies and how we can transform the conditions that allow trafficking to happen in the first place. 
Um, the last thing I can say is we use a harm reduction lens. And what harm reduction means isn't that for certain kinds of behaviors or choices, there's a lot of harm involved. And so we try to reduce the harm. What harm reduction means is there's a lot of things we do in our everyday lives that involve harm. Um, and there's a lot of ways that we put into place practices to try to reduce that harm. So for example, I may drive in a car. There's risks of harm associated with driving in a car. So I wear a seatbelt, right? That's harm reduction. I follow the traffic laws. That's harm reduction, um, right? So we look for a harm reduction approach to ending trafficking. How can we reduce harm to transform the conditions that allow trafficking to happen? Um, I'm going to be joined by two brilliant organizers today, two of my favorite people in the world. And I'm going to see if I can add the first one to join us today, Sophie Otiende. Sophie is the CEO of the Global Fund to End Modern Slavery and is the founder of Azadi Kenya which is a Nairobi, Kenya-based um, survivor leadership organization doing incredible work all the way on the other side of the world where it's in the middle of the night and Sophie is joining us late at night in, in Kenya. So thanks for being here with us, Sophie. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, so I, I think one of the things I wanted to start with, both of us have a, a passion for survivor leadership. And so I think I'd love to have you just share to you, when you think of survivor leadership, what does that mean and why is it important? I, I, first of all, I wanna get into, you know me, I wanna get into the words, right? <laughs> um, I'm a nerd that way, right? So uh, I think one of the issues that I currently have is that when we talk about survival leaders, we talk about it as if it's a strange new concept. When in reality, survival leadership and leadership, mainly what I see by impacted communities is something that has existed. Those of us who are in movement building and have, exist, have worked in movements, it's not new, it's basic movement leadership. And basic movement leadership means leadership that is inspired by, as you said, designed, implemented everything by the people who are impacted by the issue that is happening, right? And so, and I know that after I say that most of the time, the question is that what are, what are the rest of the people going to do? And I feel like when we, def it, if we define survival leadership outside a movement, it becomes very problematic is when we start having some of the issues and questions that people ask because i feel like defining survival leadership outside a movement then becomes very difficult because it just doesn't fit i think survival leadership is a concept and part of movement uh, movement building and movement leadership and should fundamentally be described and designed within that concept and the reason why we are struggling with it in the within the trafficking sector is because generally i have said this before we are not a movement so we we aren't designed and built and working on principles of movement building so it's a concept that we we are trying to fit in a space that isn't designed to take it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Like leadership designed outside of the movement, you mean outside of this organizing movement of communities who are impacted by it. So when we yes. look, tell us what leadership means. Yes, and also that it just, that things that come inherently as a result of being in a movement, that trying to explain to people who are working in a sector just becomes really difficult. And I, I, can, I can see that that's the challenge that we are facing right now. Because when someone asks, when you say survival leadership, then what happens to people who don't have lived experience? My response is always, survivors are not asking that question right now because we are not leading anyway, but somehow we figured out a role to play actively and again, if you are using principles of movement building, you wouldn't, the only role you can play is not in a movement is not leadership. There are many roles to play apart from leadership. Yeah. So 
I, 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 so for me, defining, and this again is something I've, I've been struggling with, defining survival leadership right now outside the concept of a movement and outside the concept of organizing is what we are struggling with trying to um to implement it within the current sector as it's designed is really extremely hard i think there's a lot of work that most survivors are doing that we are doing to try to explain to break down and the easiest thing is some of the work that we've been doing is trying to explain that you know survival leadership is a continuum it's not a one size fits all it's different things it's not just having a survivor on the table it's asking all these questions but then when you take out survival leadership for example and i'll give this i'll be very vulnerable and, and give an experience like i'm in a position of leadership in a powerful organization right now some of the challenges that I'm facing is basically as a result of the system not being ready for the kind of leadership that we are saying. But if I was in the context of a movement where care is care for my needs as a survivor leader have been thought of, I wouldn't be having the challenges that I'm having. Mm. So for me, without having the principles that fundamentally make a movement, survival leaders and survival leadership is always going to be lacking. Mm. It's always because it's always going to be lacking because I think there's a care, there's a thoughtfulness, there's an intention intentionality that the sector just can't get right. Yeah. I think that comes out. So talking about that, that comes out a lot in what we see in awareness campaigns. Um, and I know that's what started this Teach Trafficking Truths Day idea is that there's a lot of awareness campaigns out there. Some of them are really authentic and uh, well informed, and some of them are more sensationalized or um, misinformed or spreading disinformation. And so I always get frustrated when I see disinformation and I say, hey, that's not entirely accurate or that's presenting a wrong view of what trafficking is. And people say, hey, you should be happy. It's awareness. And it's like they don't even realize that sometimes awareness can cause harmful impacts. So I'm wondering if you've seen ways that these impacts that are well intended again, right, but because it's not coming from a movement, it's coming from um, not from organizers who have lived experience, it gets it wrong. So what what are some of the impacts that that have and what recommendations do you have for us to to be more thoughtful about our awareness so i'm going to talk about two areas fundamentally two areas that i think if you think about what i call like the first wave of the sector as we know it has been fundamentally focused on the criminal justice system and it's been focused on the criminal justice system as a result of what people are saying quote unquote awareness because essentially the awareness that was created cre basically created a victim that needed to be rescued and therefore the solution was a police officer or a law enforcement system and everything. And I'm not saying those things are fundamentally wrong. Uh, it's that a clear narrative was set that designed a very, very clear solution and that essentially meant investment in the criminal justice system. Again, as a fund, I have to check. We, we can't just say awareness is awareness because awareness means knowledge and knowledge then is what impacts the decisions that are made. It impacts policy, impacts where investment is put. So if you look at in the past and some of the, some of the things that have been funded generally, so speaking as a funder, some of the money and what people donors rely on the information, the awareness that people are saying is, is just awareness to make decisions about where investment is placed. So invest in, investment was heavily placed on the criminal justice system, despite the fact that many survivor leaders said, you know, no, we need more holistic support. We need all these different things. That did not work out because of the narrative that was clearly set as a result of quote unquote awareness. So awareness is not just awareness. Awareness is about knowledge. And I think we need to stop using the word awareness. 
because we're not just creating awareness we're distributing knowledge we're distributing information if we start thinking about it that way then we are responsible for distributing the right information so the second area is around care and you know protection again as a protection practitioner care and protection is really important to me when you look at the models of care and the model, rehabilitation model that we see is again as a result of what people call quote unquote awareness most of all the survival leaders on this call and then that you speak to have been talking about long-term community-based support as being the solution right but at the end of the day is that the model that primarily is being funded that is primarily being implemented it's not and we know the reason why it's not it's mainly as a result of the quote unquote general awareness and information that doesn't the right information not getting to the right people who are making decisions so yes it's not just awareness it actually when misinformation happens harm eventually will be caused mm, that's a that is i'm seeing in the chat fire emojis and preach emojis and uh, a lot of support so thank you and sophie i realized i know that we we have one more incredible speaker i want to get to join us but i realized i dove right into asking the questions without giving you a moment to tell like a 60 second version of what you do and where people can find more about how you're working to change these narratives and this this way of funding so um I'm currently the Chief Executive Officer of the Global Fund to End Modern Slavery. I'm really, really excited about our new strategy, which focuses exclusively on funding movements that are led by impacted communities and people with lived experience. So please find me. You can follow GFMC. You can. I'm also the founder of a wonderful survival-led organization called Azadi. You can also follow them and see the work that they do. And I think, yes, I'm, I'm Sophia Tende on all my channels, so look for me. Thank you so much for, for joining us, Sophie. Okay. Hi. All right, thank you. Sleep well. <laughs> yeah, well good night. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to bring Ashante Taylor Cox of um, you are more than on with me um, in just a moment. But while we're waiting, I figured it was um, worth mentioning the what human trafficking is. So if someone's joining us and this is brand new to them and they're just now learning. So human trafficking, there's a few different ways it can happen. One of them is when anyone of any age is forced into any form of labor, whether that's farm work, uh, commercial sex, domestic work, um, stripping, camming, um, any kind of work, any form of labor through force, fraud, or coercion. Force involves violence, fraud is trickery, and coercion means there's some sort of threat or, or pressure or fear. It's also trafficking anytime there's a minor involved in commercial sex, and that can be really tricky for people to understand because obviously this can look like a lot of different things. It can look like a younger child who's being commercially sexually exploited can look like an adolescent being groomed by an adult or an older minor, or it could look like a homeless or runaway young person who just trades sex and doesn't have a third party facilitator of any kind, but they're all trafficking and no, without a doubt, no adult should ever be paying to have sexual contact with a minor ever mm -hmm. for any reason, right? But because it looks different ways, prevention is gonna look different ways for those different things. So that's what trafficking can be. People need, um, when they've experienced trafficking, they need a lot of support, but we also need to think about holistic prevention. And that sometimes means transforming communities and conditions that trafficking happens in. And I know Ashante is here with You Are More Than, which is an organization that's doing direct support for survivors of trafficking to to help them, like Sophie was talking about, build that long-term investment of wellness, and also does a lot of education that contributes to good prevention. So Ashante, welcome. Did you want to tell us a little about your work? Yeah. Hi. Thank you for having me. So hi, everyone. My name is Ashante. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the founder and executive director of You Are More Than. We are a national organization um, working with BIPOC and LGBTQ plus survivors of the commercial sex industry and those who identify as domestically trafficked. Um, and we do exactly what Sophie was talking about around looking at that holistic long-term care and focusing on seeing survivors 
survivors beyond uh, that crisis point, because a lot of investment goes into helping survivors through crisis. But then what happens after? What happens after? And how do we support them in the long term so that, you know, we can continue to have healthy and fruitful and wonderful lives. And we also are very like strategic about investing in marginalized communities because oftentimes when you look around uh, within anti-trafficking organizations, there will be a lot of black and brown and queer people and there's not safe spaces for us. Um, and so I wanted to create that type of space for our community and we have been in existence since 2020 and I love the work that we do. So I'm so happy to be a part of this call and, and to chat with you, Chris. Yeah. I'm excited getting to have a call with you and Sophie in one day is a treat. Yes. <laughs> Sophie shared a little bit about survivor leadership and I know I'm I'm thinking she brought out sort of like this how it's been done mm -hmm. and what it's going to. And I wonder if you wanted to share either some reflections on what we've seen and what we see changing now. Where do you think we're going with survivor leadership? What is it what can it look like in the future? My hopes is that we are no longer talking about survivor leadership as a concept, like Sophie was saying, like, as this is a new thing, because it's not. Um, but it's moving beyond a big part of our work is helping individuals, especially allies, understand that survivor leadership can look more than a survivor showing up in this space to share their trauma narrative. That is the old survivor leadership. You're like, yes, I'm putting a survivor in our community so that they can raise awareness and share their trauma. And this will bring new donation dollars and then we'll make things so great and the survivor will feel empowered. Yes, there's spaces where sharing our experiences can be empowering, but when you limit survivors to that only sector of being, especially within the anti-trafficking movement, it limits us because at the end of the day, we have these abundance of different capacities and it doesn't only have to look like us standing up in front of a room and saying, here are all the bad things that ever happened to me in my entire life. Cool. <laughs> like, what? No. like, let's do other things. And I think, too, there's a dynamic as well where survivor leadership needs to be expanded to understand that you can be a survivor leader without working in the anti-trafficking movement. And I know people don't like when I say that, but you could do leadership in your community and it has nothing. It don't got to do nothing with the anti-trafficking movement because this movement can be harmful. So, you know, being able to invest in survivors, one thing that YMT does really well is we invest in survivor-led small businesses. Has nothing to do with the anti-trafficking movement. Some businesses have nothing to do, totally random. They're doing their own thing, but that is investing in survivor leadership. You're investing in them so that they can invest back into their community and they can invest back into their well-being long-term. We have to get out of this box of seeing survivors as this fragile individual and really see us as dynamic individuals that can bring more to the table than just say, hey, this is my trauma and this is where I show up. Mm, I love that. And thinking about the, the sharing the trauma and feeling empowered, there's a difference between sharing your trauma to feel empowered in front of a public audience mm -hmm. and sharing trauma to get that validation in a support group or as mm -hmm. created to hold your wellness at the forefront, right? Yeah. Um, so I know we talked a a little about awareness and I love how Sophie said if we recognize that awareness is education and it impacts decisions that are made in policy we now have a responsibility to be thoughtful about that I wonder if you had any things where you wanted to just sort of offer cautions or recommendations around if we're if we're wanting to spread awareness and get people engaged how do we do this without contributing to harm Oh man, how can I say this in two minutes? Okay, so I think that over, <laughs> I think overall we have to be cognizant that just because you hop on TikTok and somebody told you that I was almost trafficked in a Walmart parking lot. <laughs> Bo, no, you wasn't. Trust your instincts. Trust, trust your instincts because being a, if you're, uh, if you're a person who is in a marginalized body, especially individuals who identify within a female identifying body, it can be very, very scary. People are scary. The world is scary. If you're a queer person and you're walking around, you got to be very cognizant about how you navigate the world. Yes, people can be scary, but not everything is trafficking. So what I will say to this is that, yes, just like Sophie said, awareness drives how it impacts our organizations. If I literally had a conversation with someone um, 
and they were just like, I'm a familiar trafficking survivor. So if no one knows what that is, that means that I was trafficked by my family members. But I met this professional where they literally said, I've never met a familiar trafficking survivor. Those people don't exist. That's weird. Why are you telling people that? That's weird, but okay. Um, how we raise awareness about the issue of trafficking impacts how I I can do my work and how I can show up for our community. And so, especially when it comes to people thinking that trafficking survivors are just blue eyed, blonde haired girls that are being kidnapped off the street. And that's the only people that we need to focus support on that directly impacts when I say to people, I had to write, oh, I'm gonna say a quick story real quick. I had to write a grant for an entity, right? And they said, you need to prove why you need these types of services why is marginalized why is services for marginalized survivors important for lgbtq people and bipoc people couldn't find any articles because people don't collect information about the type of that the type of communities that they support because it's just like we're supporting everyone people think that queer people just inherently are hypersexualized and that if they engage in the commercial sex industry that there's no harm that could ever happen so we're not going to give them any support then if we this a side night a note conversation but then if we talk about sex work everyone just like starts throwing up and having a meltdown and it's like we can have these nuanced conversations mm. and be able to support people and raise awareness about things without making everything feel like it only can be seen one way because mm -hmm. when we walk into dynamics and people think that trafficking only looks like temp control trafficking trafficking only looks like someone getting kidnapped off the street trafficking only looks like that crazy ass movie that came out a month ago or so <laughs> And that's only what trafficking looks like. You're causing harm to the communities and the people that are actually doing work. Because mm -hmm. then when I go, I, I will share one more story. I went to the doctor's office and on the doctor's office wall, they were talking about trafficking and it was in Spanish. It was only in Spanish. And it was a girl, which like in chains. Cool that they're in Spanish. Yeah, which good. Yes, please be accessible. But why is the girl in chains? And why is the picture <laughs> black and white? Like, damn, y'all couldn't afford printer, like color printer. Like, I don't know. That is harmful because you <laughs> you are not acknowledging that trafficking can look very, very different. Different, and yes, for different communities, you need to approach it in different ways so that you can make sure that they know that there's support out there, and you need to be aware of how you're raising awareness because a lot of people are being uh, not seen because you're not even thinking about them. Okay, I'm done. No. Oh, I'm, <laughs> we had another half hour. I should have signed up for two slots today, but thank you yeah. so, so much. Y'all make sure you're following You Are More Than on Instagram. Um, and any other socials you're on? Yeah, we're on TikTok. I'm very active on TikTok. You can follow us on Instagram. Check us out on our website. If you need support, check us out on www.yamt.org. And it was so nice. Thank you so much for having me today, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just so grateful that we get to have these incredible people and that we're all getting to share this time together. Um, thank you, Ashante. Thank you. Thank you, too. Bye. So one thing I want to name, just because I saw, um, for, the, for those of you who are still with us, one thing I saw recently was when we said something about um, how these stories are sensationalized. I know that I heard someone say, oh, you're suggesting that they made the stories up. And I just kind of want to name that if you hear someone talking about sensationalism, that doesn't mean that they think the story is false. When we look at a sensationalized story, that means that they took the story and told it in the most dramatic and emotional way they could. But a lot of times that then leads people to want to do these rescues that you heard Sophie and Ashante talking about. It can lead to some practices that aren't always the best practices. So if we say sensationalized, that means we need to give people facts. We need to make sure they understand the issue, but we don't have to just go out of our way to make it sound like this wild thing that needed a wild rescue. Because for a lot of survivors, especially adult survivors, leaving their trafficking situation doesn't look like a rescue. It looks like having enough late night, dark nights of the soul where you sit around deciding what you what you need to do to take care of yourself. And that needs a whole different kind of support and a whole different kind of prevention. So I am super grateful that everyone was able to join us today. Please find us. You can sign up for our newsletter at nationalsurvivornetwork.org. 
follow us on uh, we're on blue sky um the the platform formerly known as twitter facebook instagram linkedin find us connect with us sign up for our newsletter at our website and follow you are more than global fund in modern slavery and azadi kenya the next up in our teach trafficking truths day today is um going to be cast la which is the organization that the national survivor network is a program of so if you want to keep your learning going you can go over to coalition to abolish slavery and trafficking's instagram and they'll be starting their live now <laughs>